If I'm using my phone, it's not because I'm checking my text messages. I'm, I have the notes for the presentation uh, on my phone. Um, so I like to. I'm the senior product manager on Jira. I work on. I've been working for Atlassian for almost five years. Jira for two years. I mostly focus on. Uh, our administration and ecosystem and APIs in the cloud, but uh, I'll cover a lot of stuff today. Um, so raise your hand if you are a, a Jira user or you know Jira. Okay, pretty good. Uh, you've been using Jira for like two years, four years, six years, eight years. <laughs> Yeah, all right, so uh, then you know that Jira has probably uh, changed a lot over time. Uh, you know, this is what Jira uh, looked like a little while ago, version 3.9. Uh, that was only in 2007. Uh, and, you know, this is what Jira looks like today. Uh, and so you can see that, and, you know, if you go back to 2007, like, there's really not that many features. There's no boards, there's no service desk, there's not even uh, dashboards. Um, and you know, today we have, uh, and we clearly did not have any designers in 2007. <laughs> and today there's a lot more features. You know, you have boards, you have estimation and sprints and epics and uh, quick filters and uh, prioritization, and yet it looks a lot cleaner and less cluttered. And so I, you know, originally when I was planning to give this presentation, I uh, thought I would talk about how we were implementing these features and trying to balance lots of features with uh, power and make them look simple and beautiful. But um, one that's usually a question, you know, that's usually a question of design and I'm not a designer. And two, you know, those kinds of solutions are usually very unique. Jira's problems are not necessarily, you know, the problems that you have for the software that you're building. It's just like a kangaroo crossing sign. It's a very good solution to a very specific problem that only people in Australia have. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm going to try to uh, be, speak a little bit more broadly uh, about, you know, use some examples of what we've done on the Jira team, but I think they can apply to uh, hopefully any product management uh, process when it comes to prioritizing your investments uh, and how you listen to your users. And so I'm really going to talk about the three things that every product manager does, which is uh, listening to your customers, prioritizing, and then executing on your feature development or your any kind of development, really. Um, so uh, if we're going to talk about listening to your customers, the first thing to know is uh, who your customers are. Uh, and that's really important. Uh, Atlassian has a big mission, and so when we think about our customers, we think about our mission. Atlassian's company mission is to unleash the potential in every team. Uh, Atlassian believes that they build tools that help teams work better together. And so in order to achieve our mission, uh, we need a lot of people to use our product. We need every team to use our products if we're going to achieve our mission. So we need a lot of users. And uh, so, and when we think about getting a lot of users, we have to look at our company's model and our company's process. Uh, Atlassian is not a stereotypical enterprise software company. We don't have salespeople, we don't have uh, discounts, we make it easy to download our product or start a trial in the cloud and uh, it's cheap to install and you, uh, we expect that uh, you tip we typically have just one team or one person in the company who starts using the product and then expands from team A to team B and then from team B to team C and maybe team C starts using Confluence or Bitbucket also and then all of a sudden they look around and it's like, okay, we should standardize across Atlassian for the entire company. But uh, we don't normally go to the CIO and just say, 
hey, we're going to sell you a 10,000 user license and it's going to cost you a million dollars over 10 years or something. Like That's not how we do it. And so in order for us to be successful, we need uh, the users to evangelize the products. And so that means that you, know, you have somebody like Susan and she uses um, Jira in her first company, in company A, and then we need her to take uh, Susan to, to the next organization or to the next uh, part of the company or to uh, the next company altogether. And for us to get that word of mouth and to that uh, expansion, um, because we don't have the salespeople, we need our users to really uh, love our products. Um, that's the number one thing we can do to achieve our mission is to get users to love our products. And so if I'm a product manager at Atlassian, I have to think, how do I get somebody to love my products? Am I doing well at getting users to love my products? And luckily there's, uh, so I should ask myself, how do I measure uh, love? And luckily, at least in um, enterprise software, there is a way to measure your love. Uh, so who's familiar with NPS? Okay, not very many. Uh, so MPS is kind of an industry standard for uh, measuring uh, user sentiment. Uh, so basically what you have is um, uh, you ask people how likely they are to recommend your product to somebody else. And you have uh, people who say zero to six. Those are your detractors, people who wouldn't recommend your product. You have uh, nine and 10. Those are your promoters, people that would recommend your product. And seven and eight, they're the people who are ambivalent. Uh, it's weighted because people are usually too nice and really only the nines and tens are people who actually recommend. So then you basically look at how many are your promoters, how many are percent of that are your promoters minus percent that are your detractors. Uh, and that's your net promoter score. So, it, so it's an index from negative 100. Uh, every single person who responds would discourage people from using your product to positive 100. 100% 100 of people would promote your product. Um, so that's, and NPS really drives everything that product managers do at Atlassian. It's the number one metric that we uh, make decisions on. We don't, th we don't think about business value or sales or cost savings or user engagement. The only thing that matters to us is NPS. Uh, and before we had NPS, it wasn't like we weren't collecting or listening to our customers or thinking about customer feedback. We had lots of different ways to, to get customer feedback. We had events like this one or big events like our summit with four or 5,000 people. We had uh, support cases coming in. We had bugs and features, feature requests that were reported on our kind of public feature request tracker on gr.atlassian.com. Um, we sent surveys to our customers, but there was, um, you know, we even had uh, people sending us stuff on social media, but the, there's a problem with all of this uh, feedback, and that was that we were talking to the same people. We were talking to the people that were the most engaged already with our product, you know, the, some, the guy who had bought the license or woman who had created a support request. And the problem with these people is that they were usually the advocates for uh, Atlassian's products in the organization, or they were the IT manager that was responsible for, uh, you know, maintaining JIRA or maintaining Confluence uh, at the company. And they were just logging, they were just representing the, the user base. And the problem with that is that we're, you know, maybe you have 2,000 people at the company that are using the product and you only have one person that Atlassian is talking to and speaking from. And we can't trust that one person can effectively represent all of the needs of 2,000 people. And maybe one person thinks, uh, you know, Tobias brought Jira into his company and he saved uh, the company $100,000 that they were giving to IBM and so Tobias is like, I love Jira, it makes me look good, but then everybody else hates Jira because Tobias screwed it up somehow. And, uh, so, and so then we, we are getting a, a bad, uh, we're not getting effective feedback from Tobias. Um, so, 
so that's why we, uh, about two years ago, started directly asking our users inside of the product for uh, their feedback. So you get a modal like this in uh, Jira and Confluence, actually in all of our products now, which we ask you to, we ask every single user on a regular basis to uh, give us feedback and we collect their, uh, their score and their role and uh, anything that they have to say. Um, and so we, we're getting a lot of feedback, more feedback than ever, but most importantly, it's coming from people that we weren't listening to before. Uh, so the number one, you know, the number one question you should be asking yourself is, you know, are you talking to all of your users? Think about uh, who you hear feedback from and who, and ask yourself, are these the people that should be determining my product roadmap? Um, or are they the people who should be t determining the sales calls, but not necessarily what I as a product manager might do? Um, I could discuss this in a lot more detail. We've actually given some presentations before on how we have implemented customer feedback and how we analyze it and uh, what we've done with it. There's a very good presentation from uh, Sean, who's our head of the voice of the customer team, uh, that if you want to get more detail on NPS, um, that. I won't derail myself here because we're here to talk about product management. Uh, and so collecting MPS was certainly not my idea at Atlassian. And to a guy like Sean Kramer, our head of the voice of the customer, like I am his customer. I'm a product manager who can make decisions about what the product team works on. And so, but, and while it's my job to kind of represent the customer for the development team, really the roadmap for the product is determined by uh, a lot of people, development, design, product management, QA, uh, business analysts, all kinds of different people have input into the process. And so you need to make sure that everybody who has uh, influence on the product roadmap also has uh, is thinking about NPS or customer sentiment and thinking about what the customer needs. And so there are a couple of different ways that we try to make sure that every, uh, everybody on the team is thinking about product feedback. Uh, the first is that we have um, every, mo every Monday morning, uh, every single person on the JIRA team gets an email like this. Uh, it has all of the it has all of the products um, with our current NPS and the goal, sorry, I can't show you our actual NPS scores. <laughs> uh, but so, so these are all numbers. Uh, so there's a goal NPS that we have for each product and our actual NPS and then, you know, how that metric is tracking. Um, and so, and so you can see like, okay, how am I doing? And so, you know, it's tailored, each product team gets something, so I get JIRA feedback. Uh, but that's not actually the most interesting thing. So then we, uh, each individual member of the team gets a random sample of the actual feedback that was sent from the users. And it's not just that we all get random samples, but every individual person gets a different random sample. So the email that I get is different from the email that the person sitting next to me gets. And that's really cool because then that becomes kind of a topic of conversation. So the first thing we're doing every Monday morning is discussing like, well, what did you hear? What did you hear? And we are comparing the different pieces of feedback and what we were, what we heard and what another customer was saying and what this means and if we could tie this back to some other feature requests or some projects that we're working on. And if that's not enough, we want to make sure that we're thinking about it not just on Monday morning, but actually the whole time, all day, every day of the week. So we put it on our development team's wall boards as well. Um, so, um, and it's, it's just, uh, don't worry, we uh, put positive feedback on the wall boards also. Um, but, you know, people put whatever they want in these. <laughs> Uh, feedback. So, you know, before we start talking about uh, what you invest in, whether it's uh, features or usability or simplicity or anything else, there are really two prerequisites, and that's 
uh, one, make sure that you are actually listening to all of your customers and understanding what they're saying. And two, uh, make sure that everybody who uh, has any influence on what you actually do is thinking about what your customers are saying. Because otherwise, like, it doesn't matter how good you are as a product manager at um, understanding the needs of the customers. If you can't get the engineers or the designers or your management to uh, adopt your ideas as well. Uh, so once you've got all that pro uh, customer feedback, it's probably time to maybe start prioritizing it. Uh, so we started getting a lot of feedback. Um, we actually were receiving you know, tens of thousands of pe individual pieces of feedback every single month. And so we, started, we needed a way to start categorizing it or grouping it somehow. And so we, we're tr we started trying to cluster keywords into categorizing. And eventually, we, la we landed on, these are three actual pieces of feedback, by the way. Uh, we ended up landing on kind of three uh, categories. You know, we had uh, things about reliability, um, functionality, and usability. Uh, and so uh, reliability, functionality, usability are a few. We didn't like the sound of that one, so we changed it to RUF, rough. Uh, so reliability uh, includes things like performance. Uh, you know, how fast can we make it go faster? How fast is it? Do we have lots of downtime? Is Jira crashing a lot? Do users keep running into bugs? Uh, mostly, does Jira feel like, this doesn't just apply to Jira, but does Jira feel like a product that we can trust? Um, and the fact is that uh, reliability R comes first. Uh, product managers don't like to hear it because building features is a lot more fun. Um, and marketing people don't like to hear it because it's really hard to market uh, reliability. And I don't think QA likes to hear it because they like um, fixing bugs and working on performance isn't the same. Um, but uh, if your customers don't trust your product, it really doesn't matter how great your features are or how slick your user experience is, because if the product is down, then it really doesn't matter. Um, the next one is uh, usability. So that's uh, you know people who are telling us that they felt lost when they were using the product or perceiving the product as complex, uh, saying it was ugly. And then finally, functionality. That's probably what, um, as product managers, we think of first a lot of the time. Like we, it's really easy to measure yourself as a product manager by uh, how many new features you build and uh, whether you have this feature and your competitor doesn't have this feature. And it's and you can convince yourself that you know if we only we had this feature, then then our product will be successful, or then we will make this one more sale, or we'll stop losing. Uh, customers to this competitor. Um, but in reality, you have to make sure that you're balancing all three of these uh, as well as you can and prioritizing between them effectively. And it would be really easy to um, prioritize them effectively if you could say, like, well, we want to do the most for all three of these, so we're going to work on all this stuff in here, uh, all the overlap between reliability, usability, and functionality. Um, but that doesn't really exist. <laughs> and in reality, it's not really a Venn diagram. It's like that. Um, and that's probably what makes software development hard. Uh, and if, if it was easy to prioritize between these three things, I probably wouldn't have anything to say tonight. Um, so this is what uh, Jira's um, breakdown of feedback looked like uh, for the calendar year 2015. Uh, so if you'll notice, the, so the first thing we noticed uh, back in January of 2015, it wasn't that we had 41% uh, of our users saying that uh, giving us feedback about usability or that 33% were asking for new features. The, it might seem unintuitive, but the most important thing to us was that 20% of our users were saying were giving us feedback about reliability. Um, this was actually our biggest concern, because uh, nobody is going to notice 
uh, those other improvements to functionality or usability if, the, if reliability is still a problem. And we had other sources of feedback from uh, our churn service, so customers that we were actually losing and going to other products and uh, or uh, evaluators who didn't uh, end up purchasing. And the feedback we got from them was that the main reason why we we're losing customers was because of reliability. So we, we made the decision that reliability was actually going to be uh, you know, focus number one. And you can see it took us a long time to actually make any progress. Um, if you are familiar with JIRA, uh, we spent most of this time working on JIRA 7.0, which uh, didn't have a lot, it didn't immediately address a lot of our um, feedback, but it did uh, have some other big benefits. And it actually, most of the, this uh, shift down in functionality feedback, we actually think was because after we released JIRA 7.0 in October, and we introduced Jira software, Jira service desk, and Jira core. The, it wasn't that people actually really needed um, as many features, but there was uh, a misalignment where people were expecting something different from what they bought. And once we uh, positioned the products better, uh, people understood what their product was actually meant to do a little bit better, and they gave us less feedback on functionality. Um, in October, we also started working a lot harder on uh, reliability. Um, when we worked on reliability, we focused on three things. The first was uh, eliminating um, scheduled maintenance time. So we uh, spent some time just to make sure that uh, we didn't have to uh, take down customers' instances for one hour every week to upgrade them to a, a new version in Jira Cloud. So we have uh, seamless upgrades now. And we're actually taking this technology to Jira Data Center as well. And we are working on, we announced at Summit, they'll be working on zero downtime upgrades for Jira Data Center also. Uh, we introduced an SRE team. Uh, who's familiar with SRE? Okay, just me then. <laughs> so I know this is maybe, uh, maybe, maybe not a great uh, topic for uh, Germany, but if, and it, so if you're running software as a service, site reliability engineering is a big step forward for your operational process. Grab me afterwards and I will talk about SRE. Um, and the last thing we worked on was uh, performance, so, uh, which is u and really user perceived performance. So we, it's easy to measure your performance in terms of you know, uh, database response time or application, um, application speed on the back end or even your page weight or your uh, download times, this uh, latency, this kind of thing. But really none of that stuff really has a direct correlation to uh, the, pr the feedback that we were receiving from our customers. Our customers don't care about any of those metrics. They just care whether or not Jira feels fast. So we needed a way to measure whether or not Jira felt fast. And the problem is that uh, feedback is kind of lagging. Somebody, if, even if we make a change immediately, we don't know whether it's going to actually impact uh, customers' perception of whether it's feeling fast. So we had to introduce um, a new metric that we called uh, Aptex. Uh, it's also kind of, it's, it last thing did not invent Aptex either, but we, uh, Aptex is uh, a, a metric for measuring user perceived performance. Uh, so we basically take a bunch of the pages in JIRA that we can say constitute, you know, the vast majority of active use. And we uh, come up with a response time that we uh, say is uh, good and a response time that we say is satisfactory. And so you get one point for a good response time and half a point for a satisfactory response time, and that's measured from the time the request comes in to the time that the page is ready for, it's usable for the user. The content is on the page and it's displayed. We can keep loading JavaScript afterwards, but it's usable. Um, so. Uh, ideally, in a perfect world, every single page has a good response, and that would be 1.0. Uh, 
and in reality, we have been tr trying to get to at least 90%. Um, but you can see that uh, our aptX and our um, reliability uh, feedback scores were actually very well correlated. And that's a, that was a really good sign because we can measure aptX with every single release. Every single day in JIRA, we can look at the change in aptX. And we can know that over the long term that those uh, improvements in aptX are going to be uh, correlated with declines in the amount of feedback that we get about reliability. Uh, and, so, and you know, we would start getting feedback like this eventually. Uh, uh, so, and, and so really the key here was that we had a good metric that we could understand, that everybody on the team could understand, and we rallied the entire team around it, and it tied back to our customers. So we knew what our customers needed, we needed a way to measure it, and then we took the entire JIRA team and we made uh, improving AppDex uh, part of the team's culture. So we said that performance was the number one team goal, and we were going to introduce performance analysis into our QA process. We added performance testing builds to our pipelines. We would measure AppDex in our um, staging environments and against internal usage to make sure that we weren't introducing any performance regressions. And we brought you know, those topics about how is this change going to impact AppDex into our everyday conversation. And it made a big improvement to that um, re reliability part of our feedback. Uh, so once we fixed reliability, uh, we moved on to usability. But usability ended up being, uh, I say ended up like it's past tense, usability is a lot harder. Uh, it's a lot harder. Um, this is the same chart uh, for this starting in January until July of this year. And you can see that we really made no progress. Um, so this is me up here in front of, in front of all of you admitting failure. <laughs> uh, so, you know, but we, you know, we've been, so know your enemy. Uh, so we, we've been, th so thinking a lot more about usability. Uh, we realized we needed to understand what we actually meant when we said uh, we need to improve usability because uh, we're making enterprise software for businesses. Uh, we're not, you know, making Snapchat. We're trying to, uh, so it's not really that important for us to have uh, a snazzy UI or uh, cool Easter eggs. It's, it's important that our product is easy to understand and usable and accessible for a lot of people. So when we thought about our, uh, it, so when we think about usability, we really mean we people have a perception that JIRA is complex and we need to make sure that we can continue making JIRA powerful while also reducing that complexity. Uh, and that's probably why the name of the uh, talk is called Simply Powerful. Uh, so there really we realize there's really three kinds of complexity. Uh, you know, and when we talk about complexity, we want to make sure we're all talking about the same thing. Uh, sometimes a screen is complex. Uh, sometimes a experience is complex. And sometimes people are saying just Jira is hard. Uh, and so there's really three different kinds. Uh, the first one is task complexity. And that's uh, the most basic kind of complexity, I think. Uh, so that's when something is just hard to do. Uh, you know, the UI gets in the way, or the instructions aren't very clear, or the buttons or icons don't make any sense. And that's the kind of complexity that's easiest to see, because you're just like, oh, what's going wrong with this page? Um, and it's the easiest to address, because you can just fix the icons or fix the instructions. Uh, but it doesn't immediately have a, a big impact. Uh, navigation complexity is uh, about experiences. Uh, so it comes when the task itself is pretty easy, but uh, getting to it, getting to that task can be a lot harder. Uh, so that, 
in the feedback, users are telling us they felt lost, or uh, you know, you see users in usability tests like bookmarking uh, different pages of your product because they don't actually know how to navigate through your product to those pages. So they just save them in a bookmark because that's how they get there. Um, that's a sign they're struggling to navigate. And but then you know, the really the most pernicious. Uh, type of complexity is concept complexity. And that's usually baked into your product at the most fundamental level. And you know, the longer, older your product has, is, Jira is an old product, it's 15, 16 years old now, uh, the you know, more <laughs> harder it is to uh, get rid of. It's probably literally architected into your database at this point. Uh, so to show you what I mean, um, so this is probably a good example of uh, ta task complexity. Um, I'm picking, uh, this is open company, no bullshit. Uh, I'm you know, ex using our own product as an example of all of these. Um, so this is the filter sharing screen in Jira. And so let's see, you have um, this warning here, uh, but the warning applies to the thing that you're doing down here, which is weird. Uh, you have this uh, add shares uh, button and this shares section, which are weird because sharing is a verb and you'd think you would just say like, I want to share this, not like, here's a share of a uh, thing. And everyone doesn't, nobody knows what everyone is. And then with this favorite, you can't quite tell whether uh, it is a favorite because it has a star or you have to click the star in order to make it a favorite. <laughs> Um, uh, task uh, navigation complexity. Um, so this screen uh, here is the uh, screen for cre uh, configuring a um, a screen. Uh, so uh, you know you have your view issues screen. Uh, it's actually pretty straightforward. It's got a name. It's got a bunch of fields that are on the screen. You can. It's pretty easy to add a new field. You type it in, select it. You can reorder them. That's all straightforward. But if you want to get to this screen, I actually have to go through all six of these screens uh, and know that you have, uh, make sure that all those fields were already created and then associated with the right screen scheme and the issue type screen scheme and the uh, field configuration scheme. Uh, it can get bad. And then concept complexity is actually uh, Probably the one that doesn't really lend itself well to a, a screenshot, uh, but maybe with per permissions is maybe a good example where you just have um, the permission scheme and you know finding it is hard. Uh, navigating uh, the page is kind of confusing. Um, but really the fundamental problem here is that there are 33 different project permissions in Jira and eight different um, permission types that you can grant those permissions to. And most people don't need all of that. Uh, they don't need, you don't need the granularity of 33 permissions and the ability to assign it to a group custom field type. Um, and so, you know, the question is, like really no amount of documentation or in-product help is going to uh, solve this problem for our users. We need to come up with a way to actually uh, abstract all of that complexity and give somebody not just a really snazzy UI for managing 33 permissions, but actually find a way to have less permissions. And that's really hard because so many things in JIRA are built on top of those 33 different permissions. And that's why concept, concept complexity is so hard to get rid of in your product. Um, and you, once, you, once you start building uh, in this concept complexity, you, it's actually a lot easier to just double down on the uh, bad concepts you already have. And once you have 33 permissions, it's a lot easier to ask for permission number 34. And it seems like a good way to solve even more of your user's problem. And so it's uh, not just about address, addressing that complexity, but actually resisting the opportunities to make it worse. We could solve a lot of problems for our users if we just added permission number 34 or setting number 562. But uh, that's not necessarily that once you have number 562, you have 563 and then 
1,020, and you're, you're never actually make, making progress in the, the right direction. Uh, so, you know, the next step is that you really have to realize, the, you know, the first step to fixing the problem is recognizing that you have a problem. Uh, so you have to understand, so you have to really think about what kinds of complexity am I actually trying to solve for? Am I just fixing a screen or is the screen hiding something that's actually a lot more complicated than just a bad user interface? Uh, so, you know, maybe some examples of things we've done. Uh, this is an update to the screen I showed you earlier. Uh, you can notice we actually didn't fix a lot of the problems, but we fixed what we thought were the most uh, fundamental problems. Uh, so the number one problem was that people were, everyone was the default option and people didn't realize that sharing a filter with everyone would expose it to uh, the public internet, which is a really bad idea in like 90% of cases. And so uh, we changed it so that wasn't the default and we didn't have to show a warning at the top. And you actually, and we renamed everyone to public, which is a lot more clear uh, as to what, what's going to happen. And we added a new option, which we thought is what most users wanted, which is I want to share it with everybody who actually can log into JIRA at my company, but not people who don't have JIRA accounts. Um, and we gave administrators the ability to actually hide that uh, public option altogether. But all of that was just really an example of it, just the uh, recognizing that in this situation it was a uh, matter of how could we address the task complexity the most cheaply. We weren't going, it wasn't the right time to solve the fundamental conceptual problems with uh, filter and dashboard sharing. So instead of trying to rewrite uh, filter sharing, we were just going to make sure that we were uh, reducing the biggest pieces of user pain and save our efforts for where we thought uh, more users were having problems. Um, another example is uh, application links. Over the last couple of years, uh, Atlassian has made a lot of investments in uh, building integration features between our products and making sure that you can get your build information and your development information in Jira and in uh, Bamboo and in Bitbucket and uh, tying Jira and Confluence together. That means that it's a lot more important to have the links between our products set up. And we kind of forgot about the actual part where you set up the links between the applications. Uh, and this is what the page used to look like. It was a mess. It was hard to understand. If uh, something was broken, you didn't even know it was broken, much less know how to fix it. Uh, and so we worked really hard to try to come up with a simpler user interface to actually show users um, show, show users what was wrong, uh, if anything was wrong, what was wrong, and then solve the navigation problem for how to actually go and repair the, the problem. Uh, and that's a, similar to the approach we took uh, with uh, a new feature that we recently released, which is uh, took some, which was trying to address a lot of that navigation where people didn't know how to get to their board or how to get to their project when they were coming into JIRA. And we had that information. It was in the top left corner up there with uh, projects and we had a projects drop down and issues drop down and a boards drop down. And we realized that uh, Really, you know, you, you're not you're not necessarily, or, but you're not necessarily sure what exactly you're looking for. And the easiest thing we could do would be to bring it all into one search bar, which had type ahead search and automatically suggested your recent projects and your recent issues. And so we added, uh, but like I said, uh, we didn't make a lot of progress uh, over the last six months, and so. What we recognize is that uh, we could make a lot of improvements that made us feel good uh, tackling that task complexity and the navigation complexity in JIRA. But at the end of the day, uh, if we really wanted to uh, drive that number down, we were going to have to think bigger. And we actually had to bite the bullet and address our conceptual complexity in JIRA. And so we 
uh, looked at the feedback that we got about usability in more detail. We took uh, over 9,000 uh, individual pieces of feedback and read each one and extracted over 100 keywords um, and tried to group them into these more detailed buckets. Uh, so that brings me to recommendation number five, hire interns who will do this for you. <laughs> Um, and so, and we've basically landed on three big bets that we're going to make in Jira over the next couple of years. Uh, so number one is project configuration. We know that uh, creating projects, maintaining projects, understanding your issue types and your workflows and your screens and your fields and your custom field context and your notification schemes and your permission schemes and your issue type schemes and your issue security schemes and your project roles, it can all become uh, a nightmare really fast. And at the same time, we need to make sure that it scales up so that somebody who's got a team of three or four can create a project uh, really quickly and get everybody into their project, but uh, we, it can also, we still have all that power that all those schemes provide us when we want Jira to work for 2,000 users or 5,000 users. Mm -hmm. And so actually developing a new model for uh, representing project configuration that we think is going to reduce that complexity is going to be really hard, but that's the biggest thing we can do um, going back to uh, actually, um, you can see that 18% of our feedback about usability, about negative feedback about usability was related to uh, configuration and administration. Uh, the next one is viewing issues. We know that uh, if you, like the one thing that every single Jira, do, Jira user you, does on the first day they use Jira and on the last day they use Jira is probably look at an issue. And so if that view issue page is cluttered or hard to understand or it's not clear what actions you can take on the page, uh, then we're not going to, people aren't going to perceive Jira as simple. And so we really need, to, but that view issue page does everything in JIRA. And so if we are going to be successful, we need to make sure that it continues to do a lot of things, but present all of that information in a more incremental, easier to understand way. That's hard. Uh, it's going to take us a lot of time. And the last one is uh, kind of navigating through JIRA. We realized with that, with the release of the the drop down that I showed you earlier, like it's a lot. It's easy to put band aids on top of uh, navigation and try to introduce more guides and more help and more um, tips to be like, you can find this here, you can find this here. If we spent more time on onboarding, we could show users everything, but that won't solve the fundamental problem where if they if you, if you can't understand how Jira's uh, information architecture is laid out in your head then you're never going to be able to navigate through the products so we need to actually make some compromises and uh, rethink from the ground up how Jira's uh, containers and objects and uh, issues relate to projects and boards relate to projects and dashboards relate to everything so that we can actually present something that you can grasp uh, right away. Uh, I wish I had uh, screenshots to show you of our successful experiments. Um, I have, I, uh, there are screenshots of things that maybe a year from now I can come back to Stuttgart and talk about how successful they were. But um, what we realized is that there, we need to invest in those big bets. And that's where we're at right now. Um, so to recap, uh, if there are four things I can suggest for you today uh, based on what we've learned, doing product management over the last couple of years in JIRA um, is that, you know, number one, you have to understand your feedback. Make sure that you are uh, talking to the right people and understanding what they're saying. Uh, next is make your feedback actually actionable. Uh, sometimes you can't just immediately action your feedback and say, okay, one person told me this, so we're going to go fix this. You have to come up with larger metrics that the entire team can understand um, that you know are going to be tied back to the feedback that you've been receiving. Uh, you have to think about where your usability problems actually are. Uh, understand 
what, you, what you're doing and what you're actually fixing. And finally, you know, don't stop after the quick wins and go back to building functionality because usually building features is not going to solve the problems if you have really deep-seated complexity problems. And if you're hearing from your users, we need this feature, we need that feature, and make sure you're actually counting how many users are telling you that they need a feature versus how many users are telling you that they're confused or uh, that your product is slow. And it's a lot easier to discount all the people that are telling you your product is slow uh, because you want to build the feature instead. But you need to make sure you have the numbers to back that up. Uh, so that's it. Thank you so much for having me. It was really great talking to all of you.